thank you for uh, providing me this opportunity to talk about uh, chronic kidney disease and the metabolic bone disease. Uh, I will uh, give a brief introduction about uh, CKD, which probably most of you know. And it is defined as uh, uh, kidney damage, either structural or functional, uh, which means abnormal urine analysis uh, in the way of proteinuria, hematuria. Are uh, sonographic abnormalities like uh, contracted echogenic kidneys or persistent kidney disease, and a persistent decrease in PFR to less than 60 ml per minute, lasting for more than three months. Uh, any of these abnormalities lasting for more than three months classifies the patients as CKD. So, any patient recovering from AKI for different reasons, if they are not diabetic or hypertensive, with no prior history of uh, renal disease. If they do not regain their normal renal function after a period of three to four months, they go under the category of CKD. So this is uh, the latest uh, classification of CKD, uh, which uh, classifies it from G1 to G5, which is basically the same as previous classification CKD 1 to 5. And the G1 uh, uh, denotes a normal or supranormal GFR, which happens in uh, uh, early diabetic uh, nephropathy with uh, hyper hyperfiltration. The rest of the stages are self explanatory. G2 being uh, uh, 60 to 89, G3 A, 45 to 59, G3B 30 to 44, uh, which classifies them under moderate to severe reduced renal function. G4 15 to 29, which is severely reduced renal function. And G, G5 is less than 15, which is kidney failure, which includes the dialysis patients also. Likewise, it's also classified depending upon the albumin, urine albumin excretion, the A1, A2, and A3. <coughs> so, uh, how to uh, calculate GFR? Uh, the reason to go by GFR is uh, serum creatinine is a very poor marker of uh, uh, renal function because uh, uh, the same uh, serum creatinine might uh, mean different levels of GFR in different patients depending upon their body weight and the age. So one of the ways to calculate GFR is by doing 24 hour urine collection, which is cumbersome and also is a lot of times inaccurate because of incomplete collections. The other ways of uh, coming up with the GFR number is Carcraft and Gall formula, though it looks complicated, very simple. 140 minus age uh, multiplied by weight divided by 72 times uh, serum creatinine. This is multiplied by a factor of 0.85 in females to uh, adjust for the reduced muscle mass in ladies. And uh, the other equation is uh, modified MDRD, which is uh, computed by most of the organizations along with the serum creatinine value. Uh, the estimated GFR also is uh, 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 comes in some of the lab reports. Uh, so that uh, gives a better idea how to adjust the most of the drugs uh, in patients. And uh, the, another, another formula available is CKDAP. So uh, here it gives an example of how serum creatinine can be very spurious. Uh, 50 year old woman, sorry, 50 kg woman with a weight of uh, age 70, uh, age 60 with serum creatinine Two might turn out to have a GFR of 17.7 when you go by the factor from Galt equation. Uh, 50 kg man, uh, likewise, age 60, the serum creation of 2 can have a GFR of 20.8, which both, uh, both of these come under the category of severely reduced renal function. The creatinine, looking at the creatinine, they look not too bad, uh, but uh, this is how, how much the GFR is. Uh, likewise, a 70 kg man. Age 40 with the same serum creatinine might turn out to have a GFR of 48.6. That is the reason we had to have an idea about the eGFR so that drug dosing is not uh, is, uh, is appropriate for uh, the creatinine clearance. And this is a graph depicting the relationship between GFR and serum creatinine. And here, uh, Here, up to a value of around 1 to 1.5, uh, 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 serum creatinine for around 1, 1 to 1.5, creatinine being depicted on the y-axis and GFR on the x-axis, uh, the GFR is fairly well maintained around 60. 
after uh, the creatinine passes 1.5 to 1.6, by the time it goes to 2, there is a significant reduction in the GFR from 60 to 40 ml. Likewise, when it goes to 3, it's almost very close to 20. So most of the loss of renal function occurs by the time patient reaches 2 mg per deciliter. So it's very important to intro in early on in the disease uh, to retard the progression. And basically, uh, they come to see nephrons late in the course of the disease. So it's very important to educate the, the people about the importance of controlling the metabolic risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, way before they get into this level. And uh, some of the things that we can do to halt the progression of CKD are keeping the blood pressure around 130 AC. And use of ACE inhibitors and ARVs in patients with proteinuric uh, conditions like diabetes and other non blood diseases. Diabetic control to keep a HbA1c to less than 7, LDL cholesterol less than 100, dietary protein restriction, moderate protein restriction to 0.7 to 0.8 grams per kg body weight, and keeping a BMI around 20 to 25, and smoking cessation. And some, these are some of the other uh, things we can do to split up the progression of CKD. Avoiding NSAIDs, uh, uh, educating the patients about how important it is to avoid over-the-counter uh, anti-inflammatory medications, and avoiding large doses of vitamin D supplements and calcitra supplements. Uh, some of the times you find patients taking uh, uh, vitamin D, active vitamin D and ca calcium preparations like Primacal AT for a long duration of time after they had a, a fracture or something. This kind of patient, uh, is an active form of vitamin D and it increases calcium level. So if there are these supplements, they should be made away to stop the medication after a certain duration of time or check the calcium level to make sure they don't develop hypercalcium, which in itself can worsen renal failure. So uh, this is something very important to keep in mind and avoiding nephrotoxins like aminoglycosides and proctoclysis anemia, which is very commonly used by most people. Uh, and it has sodium phosphate, large load of sodium phosphate, which can complex with calcium and get deposited acutely in the kidney, making renal function worse. It can either uh, uh, cause development of ERF or even if it doesn't become manifest right away over a period of three to four, six months, patient can slowly develop into CKD. So it's very important uh, to make sure uh, we avoid all nephrotoxins possible in this age group, uh, group of patients who are at high risk for progression. And uh, follow up and treat uh, uh, GM, stone disease, reflux disease, actively to retard the progression and avoiding infections, particularly in our country, any sort of infection makes the kidney function worse. So uh, basic hygienic measures like uh, uh, good, like making sure they eat the proper food to avoid the gastroenteritis and appropriate immunizations to, uh, against uh, pneumonia and uh, influenza, all these things matter a lot. And basic clinical tests uh, on situs suspicion of CKD. And prevention of uh, stroke, ischemic heart disease, and peripheral vascular disease because, again, uh, these people when they develop these problems end up requiring some death test, requiring uh, IV contrast, which makes the renal function worse. So, basically, uh, making sure they control the metabolic factors well, with, uh, uh, which contributes to all three kidney disease, stroke, mm -hmm. ischemic heart disease, everything. And uh, these are the common uh, causes of end stage renal disease, diabetes followed by hypertension, gonophritis, and cystic disease. And uh, diagnosis, uh, usually there is a long-standing history of edema, oliguria, polyuria, proteinuria. And uh, this is when the, present, the patient presents to us with uh, no previous lab values available, uh, the going by the history. And uh, creatinine elevation, like I said, uh, persisting for more than three months. And evidence of renal osteodystrophy. When a patient comes, we don't know if it is AKI or CKD. When we do calcium and phosphorus levels and uh, look for anemia, acidosis, uh, and other other some contracted kidneys, all these things mean it's most likely long standing renal disease. Because these things don't develop uh, over a period of a few weeks or a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 brief management strategy again diet and drugs in renal failure, mild protein restriction to 0.7 to 0.8 grams per kg body weight, and avoiding potassium containing foods, especially coconut water, fruit juices, dry fruits, and nuts are very rich in potassium. And also advising patients to bleach the fruits whenever uh, they take, and tomatoes are also rich, and all the uh, artificial uh, uh, drinks like compound, all those things are rich in potassium. 
and oral and IV iron and ectropartin treatment to correct anemia, correction of acidosis and uh, phosphorus binders to control uh, PTH, uh, phosphorus level and active vitamin D to control the PTH situation. <coughs> and now I go on to the uh, CKD BMD. It is uh, uh, defined as a systemic disorder uh, of bone and mineral metabolism manifested by abnormalities of uh, calcium, phosphorus, PTH and vitamin D, abnormal bone turnover and mineralization, vascular and other soft tissue calcification. Uh, this uh, seems like uh, something that is chronic condition, but uh, it, 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 it contains also the um, uh, vascular uh, problem because patients who, are, who have hyperphosphatemia are likely to develop vascular cancer patients and are very at high risk for LVH and uh, cardiac events. So it's very important to control um, uh, the uh, bone disease in CKD. And uh, this is uh, the PTH, how it works. Uh, um, it's stimulated by low calcium or high phosphorus level. And uh, it basically works on the bone to stimulate calcium release and uh, stimulate phosphorus release. And on the kidney, it stimulates calcium reabsorption and inhibits phosphorus reabsorption. Thus, contributes to phosphaturia. And uh, the pathophysiology of bone uh, renal osteodystrophy is uh, uh, reduced GFR with advancing renal disease CAHAS, uh, decreased phosphorus excretion by the kidney, and elevated serum phosphorus, which in turn increases the PTH level and uh, uh, the levels of FGF23. And both these mm -hmm. hormones try to keep the phosphorus in check by promoting phosphaturia by the kidney. And hyperphosphatemia also has decreased calcium and resistance to the action of uh, calcitriol on the parathyroid and decreased calcitriol production by the kidney. As we all know, calcitriol is made by the kidney from the, uh, by one alpha uh, hydroxylase. So all these three factors uh, lead to elevation of PTH. And uh, this is a uh, brief uh, chart about uh, the role of uh, calcitriol <coughs> and uh, bone disease. CKD is associated with the deficiency of uh, decreased uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D level and uh, uh, also reduced activity of 1 alpha hydroxylase, which converts 25 hydroxy vitamin D to calcitriol in the kidney. So, uh, deficiency of uh, calcitriol in turn. Uh, has reduced the expression of uh, vitamin D receptors and calcium sensing receptors in the parathyroid uh, uh, gland, uh, which causes hyperplasia of parathyroid gland. And it also uh, has reduced the calcium absorption from the uh, intestines, thus contributing to hypocalcemia, which in turn stimulates uh, parathyroid uh, production. And uh, it also has skeletal resistance to the calcemic action of PTH. And so more and more PTH will be produced to keep the calcium levels up in CKD. And uh, FGF23 is uh, uh, produced by the uh, one of the novel markers of uh, CKD BMD. It is produced by osteocytes and osteoblasts in response to hyperphosphatemia. And it basically causes uh, uh, phosphaturia and uh, helps to reduce the phosphorus level in the body. And uh, it can reach up to 300 to 400 times the normal range in CKD patients. Uh, it's a predictor of LVH, vascular calcification, and mortality. And uh, there are a few other conditions that are associated with uh, elevated FGF23 levels, mm -hmm. namely tumor induced osteomalacia and uh, inherited hypophosphatemic disorders. So this again shows uh, the association of FGF23 with uh, endothelial dysfunction, LVH, progression of CKD, and uh, uh, increased mortality. So the basic stimulant for uh, FGF23 is hyperphosphatemia. So it's very important to control the phosphorus level in uh, CKD patients, uh, which starts uh, uh, like in CKD3 and 4 itself, patients start developing hyperphosphatemia. So it's uh, important to control the levels uh, so that we don't uh, uh, have high FGF levels in the body which can in turn cause all this damage. Uh, some of the symptoms are of the renal osteodystrophy are, uh, it could be asymptomatic for a long time uh, and significant elevation of PTH can cause arthralgias, bone pains, peripheral neuropathy,
skeletal deformities and resistance to the action of erythropoietin due to marrow fibrosis. And pruritus, uh, calciphylaxis, soft tissue and vascular calcification. So, uh, diagnosis patients in their uh, 40s are 84 higher risk of uh, hip, hip fracture compared to their age match controls. Uh, and likewise, patients with CKD, four are fourfold high risk of uh, hip fractures compared to age match controls. So, some of the lab parameters to reassess to uh, diagnose the CKD MBD are uh, hyper. Uh, Phosphorus level uh, characterized by hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, elevated PT, PTH, elevated alkaline phosphatase. Uh, these are the four main markers, <laughs> and the suggested frequency of monitoring is once in three to six months. And these are the target levels that we want to aim phosphorus level around 3.5 to 5.5, calcium phosphorus product of less than 55, and PTH level 150 to 300. The management of uh, real elastic dystrophy uh, includes uh, diet, uh, phosphate binders, active vitamin D compounds like the calcitriol, and uh, calcium supplements. Dietary phosphorus restriction is important because it uh, <coughs> controls the elevated PTH and also FGF23 levels. Foods high in phosphorus are uh, Milk and milk products like cheese and ice creams, etc. Vegetables like sweet potatoes, green peas, dried beans, and sea, uh, seafood like oysters, uh, sardines, organ meats, and processed meats. Uh, beverages, particularly dark colored colas, beer, ginger ale, cocoa products, etc. And other fruits, the fruits like nuts and seeds, and whole grain products. Uh, egg white is a good source of uh, uh, protein but is less in phosphorus, so it's uh, highly recommended if patients can take egg whites uh, because most of the foods that are rich in uh, protein are also rich in phosphorus. So you have to keep both of these things in mind, particularly in our uh, region, malnutrition is very common in CKD patients, so uh, we have to advise regarding diet appropriately so they won't end up having malnutrition uh, in an attempt to control their phosphorus level. Mostly, uh, the meat and meat products are very, very high in phosphorus. So, Western diet uh, is, uh, gives a large load of phosphorus compared to the Indian counterparts. So, this is uh, the phosphorus balance in dialysis patients. Uh, uh, intake of phosphorus is around 800 to 1000 mg per day, uh, which amounts to around 7000 mg per week. 60% uh, of that is absorbed by the intestines, uh, which uh, gives a load of 4,200 milligrams. And uh, hemodialysis uh, done in 4 hours, uh, uh, about 3 times a week, removes around 2,400 milligrams of phosphorus. And rest of the phosphorus, 4,200 minus 2,400, comes up to 1,800 milligrams a week load of phosphorus, and which is divided uh, by 7 and not 2 more minutes. Uh, so about uh, 250 milligrams of phosphorus per day has to be removed by binding to the uh, phosphorus binders. So these are some of the phosphate binders, uh, calcium based uh, uh, binders like acetate and carbonate, magnesium and aluminum based binders are not used much because they can accumulate in CKD patients and uh, uh, cause toxicity and lanthanum carbonate is another phosphate binder, several other hydrochloride uh, is commonly used, calcium acetate is four stack. Uh, Cerebellamer is Cerebellamer, 4 seal, all those things are uh, dispensed in a dose of 800 to 400 milligrams. And uh, well calcium based binders are well tolerated, but uh, they contribute to calcium load and positive calcium balance and vascular calcification. Cerebellamer is a very good binder, and um, other benefits include uh, uh, lowering of LDL, anti acromatous, and anti inflammatory effects. And all these binders have to be take, strictly taken with meals uh, uh, to uh, reduce the phosphorus levels. And lanthanum carbonate is also a fairly good uh, uh, binder, uh, but uh, long term uh, studies are not there uh, regarding the use. And these are, this is the amount of phosphorus bound by the different mm -hmm. binders. And uh, this is the target vitamin D level in CKD patients, uh, uh, to be kept around 30. 
and PTH more than uh, 300, they have to be treated with uh, active vitamin D compounds. And uh, role of sinacalcet, uh, it's a calcium antic agent used uh, in treatment of uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism, particularly when the patients uh, have hypercalcemia associated with uh, high PTH levels because uh, vitamin D compounds contribute to further elevation of calcium. So in those kind of patients, uh, this is a good uh, agent to control secondary um, hyperparathyroidism. And role of parathyroidectomy. Severe hyperparathyroidism is not amenable to medical measures uh, and tertiary hyperparathyroidism where the gland becomes independent of calcium and does not respond to any sort of oral drugs and uh, recalcitrant calciphylaxis and metastatic calcification. These are some of the indications and that's it.